haven't touched on that. That's, that's the revenue side of your budget. Now we're spending a little bit of money in, the, in this next work session. So uh, we, you'll see the reflection of that again on March 9, the expense side. The CIP obviously stands alone, but this is a really important CIP because this, you know, finally uh, after two plus years of, of chasing this down, we are ready to formally present our uh, referendum for this November. The slide deck, I'm telling you, up front is a little bit different in order than probably what you have in front of you because we've just recently incorporated the, uh, the school's actions on the referendum from last night. So you'll see that reflected here and we will update this, uh, this deck on the web and we'll get you a copy uh, as well. But I uh, just wanted to to let you know as we roll through this. So we're gonna do a couple of things, as we always do, I think it's really important is just give you some brief updates. It's not exhaustive in any way on the current projects that are underway. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to stand up here and say, here's what we plan to do, but we always wanna make sure that we're showing that we're following through on a, on a very active um, capital portfolio. And Mr. Bowles and his team uh, doing a wonderful job moving a lot of that forward. And you'll see a lot of recent and upcoming uh, opening dates on those projects. The ARPA updates in here uh, primarily because we were able to position so much of those one-time dollars as you would expect and, and it's really hope from us uh, to advance capital priorities and it really becomes a supplement to the CIP. So we pull that back into the conversation a little bit and then we will walk through the highlights of the CIP that aren't referendum related, a couple of those major categories and then we will end with uh, some in-depth uh, items on the referendum itself. So projects underway. Again, won't hit all of them, but I think these are some of the marquee ones. This is the Lothian Library. Uh, should get under construction this spring for a late summer, mid-summer opening next year, 25,000 square foot branch. We're very excited about that project. Uh, not too far from it, and this, you know, this picture changes, I think, by the hour, but the Mid-Lothian Fire Station looking very good, and that is a spring opening. All of those operational items are in your in your operating budget but this is a it's a beautiful station and they're making a really good progress on that a few others you know, not to be forgotten about beulah recreation center mr holland i know that one's close to you uh, construction is underway and they are expecting to uh, to open that up this year the fleet facility over here on the campus again one that probably you can come here and do all your business and not even notice all the activity that's happened but that's a really important project for, for the general services team to get all those uh, facilities consolidated there and have some new space uh, to be able to perform that very valuable work right here on the county complex. So they're very excited about that project. The Enon Firing Range, again, a 2022 open. Uh, that's, that project's been underway for a little bit of time. Sidewalks won't get into the, uh, the specific projects here other than to say there's a lot of activity that's uh, being managed, I think mostly by uh, Mr. Smith and his group. And this has been a big push of this board for sidewalk funding. So we have, over time, it's in the current year, it's at $2 million, an annual drop in your CIP. We ratchet that up to $3 million with the pros plan for 23, and then ultimately settle at $5 million a year for what we call community connectivity, because it's not all sidewalks. It can be trails or anything really just pedestrian friendly. So that's a major accomplishment, I think, of this plan. Um, if you think about how much uh, money will be going into that over the duration of this, of this CIP. The ARPA uh, program, again, going back, we, as we do, anytime that one-time federal money shows up, try to invest that uh, as much as we can into one-time pieces. The CARES dollar really took care of a lot of our uh, acute COVID needs in terms of the things we had to do to just sort of continue business. And then when ARPA came along, you know, we've sifted through this and continue to do so to figure out how we can make meaningful, long-lasting investments in the community with these monies. Parks is the place where it's made the most sense, although they did come back and tweak that rule book a little bit. But I think what you're going to see is a little bit more parks when we get to the referendum. But we're able to drive some of those dollars into the middle school projects to help with the acceleration of the uh, Fallen Creek project and then the Western 360 middle school up to, we believe, $25 million to... Um, support what's going on there. So I think that's a really good uh, headline. And I think it's, you know, we've talked about schools already here tonight. We, we have that graph. It needs to be updated probably for the last year or two, but we have it on a consistent basis for both sides of the organization. So we'll get that to you in very short order. But I think, you know, that $25 million, you read article in the TD today, 
Uh, there's some unfortunate uh, dialogue in there, but those are the kinds of things that are missed in terms of the way this board supports the school division. But $25 million coming out of your ARPA allocation, absolutely no requirement for you all to do so. Uh, and there was a $28 million contribution made out of your CARES money. Again, no, no requirement for you to be able to do so. And we'll hi highlight some other examples here, and we'll certainly touch on that with the charts that Ms. Haley asked for on March 9. Uh, but I think that that's worth pointing out. You see a few other projects um, listed out there, but the biggest piece, again, that's not on here, is trying to figure out how much of this ARPA money we can use to, to buy down those middle school projects. And then, again, that expands your referendum capacity on the school side to make sure we can get in all the projects that, uh, that you all have expressed interest in. So let's look at the CIP in total. So this is inclusive of uh, referendum items as well as everything else that we do in terms of uh, our capital planning. You see a very, this is the funding source side. So this is how do we pay for it. And I think the, the main takeaway here is this is a very balanced uh, plan. So to be able to show you a pie chart like this on the verge of the largest general government referendum in our history, and you still, you'd have to focus in, I think, your eyes to figure out which slice is debt. You see CBTA at over $152 million. And I think that also helps to underpin, and I should mention, we cut the vehicle registration back to, uh, to $20. I think there was a recognition by this board that you know the sales tax had gone up to really support the CBTA. So some of that's a balancing act within that space. Uh, but $152 million of our funding source uh, directly from the CBTA. The general obligation at 165, but the PAYGO at almost you know generally proportional equal slice at $130 million. And PAYGO is, means nothing more than cash money. It can be reserves from uh, like Mr. Durkin touched on for a few projects you'll see, but it's more that ongoing part of our annual revenue stream that we pledge to the CIP so that we manage the load that's on that credit card. So where are we spending it? Uh, this is Mr. Smith's favorite slide. I see 44% into the uh, community development division and, uh, and those various initiatives. And I think this is really more responsive to feedback that we have gotten from the board. There's a lot of uh, really landmark things I think we're able to do, even in the non-referendum portion of this budget. We're going to touch on those in a second. The rest of the portfolio, fairly balanced. Public safety is always going to be a big category. That's largely the referendum items that we'll touch on. And then major maintenance at over $75 million as we remain in compliance with all of uh, those policies. So this is the one I just mentioned. A little bit, $273 million across a variety of initiatives, and I'll touch on a few. Again, the if the registration fee goes down to 20, this budget, and we've been trying to get here for a few years, COVID interrupted us a little bit, but all of the remaining registration fee income that we would receive would be a dedicated pledge source to the CIP. In this first year, I mentioned a lot of that goes to community connectivity program, as well as uh, over $3 million to do some of the work on Woods Edge Road. Um, so that, that, that for the duration, all five years, and for the foreseeable future, vehicle registration becomes a dedicated capital funding source. That's a, that's a big headline. The second one, I think, is, is a brand new initiative with this plan. But I think what we've found over the last several years is there's a gap and our capital strategy between a, you know, a $15 million library and then what we can do on a really small scale through your district improvement funds, where you may go out and replace a scoreboard or a gazebo or something on a very small scale. But so what we have put in place, what's that? Tree. Tree, trees, absolutely. That's a, it's a capital asset, of, as uh, Dr. Casey would, uh, would point out. Um, but district enhancement funds really <laughs> aimed at hitting that sweet spot between the very small scale and sort of what would be covered in a referendum. So there's five and a half million dollars of funding in here in year one in FY23. That would be, and we would need to develop some criteria if this gets approved. We would have time, of course, to do that before July 1. But they would be aimed at a lot of the, you know, water, sewer, connectivity type items. And Ms. Haley, that you've touched on, some of this, you know, school safety type improvements or turf, you know, field improvements, uh, Mr. Carroll, that you've brought to our attention. So I think every single one of you, all of your stories are a little bit different, but do you all have a unique need in your districts that we really don't have another funding source to match up to? Yes, sir. I just want to make sure it, I wasn't talking about artificial turf. Yeah, yes, sir. Natural turf. <laughs> Thank you. Natural turf. Fescue. Yeah, we're with you. 
Um, so that, that's a you know, five and a half million. We would evaluate, you know, kind of what the spend down there was, but obviously it's a life to date. Gives you all a chance to, you know, for larger projects that are going to have more than a 12 month duration to have that, uh, that ongoing appropriation. Community connectivity, again, reached $5 million a year by 24. I think that's a big uh, accomplishment. There's $200,000 for the establishment of a housing assistance program, which is targeted to seniors. It's basically a loan. We go in, uh, help them make improvements to their homes, and then when they sell, we get that money back, and it's a revolving loan. And again, we can grow this over time. It's a lot of success in year one. We could put another drop in next year, but I think uh, Mr. Cohen and his team have pushed out. I think that's a nice uh, addition to our community enhancement uh, lineup. And then blight eradication, we've always had that as part of the CIP, but it's usually been around $50,000 a year, life today, and it, it builds up, and those projects can be pricey, but we were putting a one-time injection here of half a million dollars, uh, recognizing, Mr. Wins, I think you've already talked about it, you know, Rockwood, a lot of these special area plans, there's been some interest in doing some of that type of work, so this gives us some resources to draw on, and again, we can evaluate it a year from now if we need to put more, if we need to take a year off because, you know, we just didn't spend it all, we can do that. That's a a nice thing about the CIP. Transportation highlights, again, you got the 150 plus or minus million dollars of CBTA. I won't go through all of these. You get enough transportation uh, work sessions, but I think just the amount of road work that we are able to do now um, because of the establishment of the CBA and all the work that happens there, I think is very noteworthy. And again, doesn't eat into our referendum. We're gonna go through the referendum lineup. We don't have to have a transportation component of that and we're able to get into a lot of the other projects that uh, we'll touch on in a second. Technology, this is not the total list, but I think these are important ones. And these are where we're using some of those reserves Mr. Dirk talked about in his revenue lineup. Emergency communication, phone system, that's, that's literally all of the, the stuff, the phones, all of the guts of the 911 center itself. Uh, they have reached a, a reaching end of life, so we're being proactive. Uh, that is cash funded and $4 million to go in there and, and make sure that we stay on top of that. That's not obviously an asset you can afford to come anywhere close to having an issue. Um, the Enterprise, Enterprise Resource Planning System, ERP, as it's more commonly known at, you see there over $12 million price tag estimate. We're talking to the consultant now. This is the financial brain, if you will, of the county and the schools. So this is Mr. Holland. I know you, you're a, uh, an ERP guy. You understand what that is. The system, by the time we get this implemented, our previous system will be the you know, better part of 20 years old. And that's just a really long time. It's still hanging in there. We're getting some upgrades and it's still working, but uh, we need to get on top of this. Again, pointing it out, that's $12 million. Schools uses this just as much. There's not an ask of the school division you know, for this item. And we could do silly things like, you know, give them these reserves in a transfer and then get it back. And, but we just don't do those types of things. So this is just another example, a quiet example of how we go through here. We'll touch on another one in just the next slide. Uh, but that's a vital system that makes everyone's job here uh, easier and capable, really. And uh, again, just, just sort of we motor along quietly is making a lot of progress on that. The siege of security infrastructure is just really just what it sounds, see, just is, you know, vital to our law enforcement community, and this is infrastructure just to protect uh, those, those devices that carry that or hold that information. So I'm just pointing that in there because, again, that's a cash-funded project that we will uh, tackle in FY23. Major maintenance, I'm happy to say we are just on cruise control here. Uh, the board has made major maintenance a priority, not only on our side, but on the school side. We achieved our, our policy goal back in 2020. You see that increase there, over $10 million. And then we have steadily stayed on that 2.5% target since then at over $12 million for FY23 uh, with you know doing those calculations moving forward. And there's some lumpiness depending on exactly what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, but we are very attentive to this. This is all cash funded, and we're able to maintain uh, those facilities. I think that's really, really important. $76 million spend over the five years. Shared warehouse facility, you see that there. That's a, a, an ongoing project. Again, school benefit, no, no school ask on, on that project. You see that as, as a uh, consistent theme here. The campus renovations, this is dropping 
about $2 million a year for the next several years recognizing, trying to, an effort to maximize our resources here on the county complex. Everything from the credit union building, uh, there's been an ongoing effort, as you're aware, to have school administration consolidated at Spring Rock Green and going back in and doing the upgrades to hopefully get the registrar consolidated over there and all the savings that come along from several leases associated with that office. So there's a bunch of these initiatives, again, to maximize our, our, the print shop. There's a variety of these. We don't know how they'll all break out, but we're just putting some money away, cash money, $2 million a year to make sure that we don't have to go out and build another building if we can get the most out of what we already have here on the campus. Airport, I think that you know we can go through the individual projects. I think Mr. Bowles does a good job keeping you um, apprised here, but I think the last bullet is the one I really wanted to emphasize because I don't think we do that quite as much as we could. But you got a $27 million program here for the airport, a lot of vital projects, but only 12% of it is locally funded. So uh, the airport team, general services team, does a lot to find those state and federal opportunities so we can make a lot of progress on that facility, but it doesn't really uh, become a draw on everything else we're trying to do from a capital perspective. So let's, uh, let's skip into the referendum, and this is the broad concept. This is um, what we have been working on, again, since you know, the fall of 19, I guess. So two plus years of pursuing this, uh, pause for COVID, we're coming back. We've been able to refine it. I think fortunately, maybe it's a little bit of several lines, a better program uh, now than what we would have looked at there because we just understand the data, the needs, and we've been able to think about these items critically. But it really revolves around four major components, fire stations, police precincts, which is a new concept uh, for a referendum. We'll touch on what that means in just a second. Parks and libraries, those cultural pieces, we've seen just how important those are. I, I think that's one of those kind of COVID silver linings. That number would not be the same as you're going to see in a second if it was not for some of the lessons or just realizations of the COVID period. And then the school piece, again, which we'll touch on. And uh, the school board did, uh, did approve their referendum to send over last night as part of their actions. So um, libraries, yeah, I didn't know if I could get that thing to work. It's just uh, you have to be in the CD division to use the, uh, to use the telestrator, unfortunately. But um, if you look here, so there's four facilities listed. Oh, I got to pick a color. I don't want red. That's, a, that's bad for a numbers guy, Dave. I can't do that. So we, we got a number of facilities here. You have Enon and Matoica in the eastern and southeastern corner of the county. And those are really, uh, those are going to be replacements in the case of Enon or an expansion in the case of Ettrick Matoica. You see the square footage numbers up in the top right-hand corner. Uh, there at, at Enon, and Mr. England, I know I don't have to tell you this, a little over 4,000 square feet. Uh, that goes to 20,000, which kind of that new standard. Ettrick Matoic also expands out to 20,000. Western Hull Street, you can see as you kind of look at the map, you know, our service area on the, the western third, you know, we don't have any facilities. They're coming down 360 to Clover Hill. The decision was made. Again, I think this is a, a reflection of the last couple of years to put a new uh, library out in that general vicinity, the upper mag area, Mag Green, Western 360, you don't have a site just yet, but it, it helps to serve that whole shed on the western end where we know there's uh, continued to be some residential growth. La Prade, not a referendum project, but a renovation there, and that is being funded from the Pet Adoption Center, which is co-located. Uh, we still plan to pursue that building, but again, a COVID reality of the way people adopt animals, the pace at which they adopt, you know, we are evaluating all that. So we've left the funding in place, but we feel like we'll be able to peel off a little bit of that original appropriation and go ahead and renovate the La Prade uh, building. And we feel like there's a nexus there just given that they're on the same site. So by the time that's all done, you will have a, anticipated to have a new pet adoption center sometime in the future, but certainly we're not gonna wait on the La Prade facility. We're able to maximize those resources and get them moving. We don't want to have dollars parked for any longer than we have to. So on, uh, on the parks and rec piece, I think that the message here is those three colored dots down at the bottom. And we've touched on this already. We have used any opportunity we can to advance our parks and rec uh, initiative. So whether it be CIP, ARPA, or some combination there, uh, but a few things that I want to point out to you as uh, we go through this particular referendum total. 
Uh, the Fallen Creek boat launch and the James River boat launch, I think that's been a stated priority of this board to activate uh, the James River as a resource of this community. We haven't done that quite as well, but you have two uh, facilities that in the course of this five year, and I should mention that, you know, we're setting this up from a financial perspective, to have all these pro projects funded in five years. They won't be completed in five years. Think, you know, things will happen and take that fifth year is not going to happen, you know, by the end of that fiscal year. But because of the way we manage our down the county side, we can be a little more aggressive in terms of funding these and then get back to other projects that may not have made this particular cut. So I think that's an important headline. Uh, the Horner Park piece, again, is another uh, important referendum project. I would do some improvements to the existing park, but really aimed at putting a, uh, a softball complex in there, that, again, that activates what is a beautiful park, perhaps a little underutilized from the community, gives it a little more focus, gives it a little more purpose, and certainly is a, a really nice addition to our sports tourism lineup. Um, you see here in the, the conservation areas, there's four of those in the plan. Uh, that's where we have purchased land over time and what Parks and Rec, uh, with, under Stuart Connick's leadership, they go in and they put some sort of light touch improvements, some maybe some gravel parking, per activate the space through trails and gives people access to those particular properties. And then when we're ready for the next phase, you kind of already have started a little bit. You start, you know, you drive people to it. You raise awareness that those facilities are in place. So I think that's a really smart way to go. And then the last piece of the referendum itself is River City Sportsplex. You heard Mr. Hill and his remarks talk about how that's just, you know, from an occupancy tax perspective and economic impact perspective, uh, it has separated us from our regional peers and we are continuing to, uh, to make some investments in that facility through uh, the referendum. And those were items, that's not a new uh, initiative there necessarily, but those are ARPA items that got pushed out because of the rule change. So we swapped some middle school money and move some of those River City pieces into the referendum. So there's not a, there's not a plus there, it's just kind of a, a reshuffling of funding sources. Mr. Carroll, I'll probably don't have to explain to you what that building is, but um, we have, over time, we do not currently own any of our police precincts, they are all rented. So what we uh, plan to do or propose to do with this referendum is to add, first and foremost, a Westchester area or the James River Station, add that so we have four precincts to match up with our four service areas for the police department and then construct county-owned facilities uh, in all four of those. We would start with the Stonebridge uh, facility. We have already purchased that and that would be part of the Spring Rock Green, uh, you know, revitalization of that area and then we would move um, to the other stations. But a significant lease savings here. You've talked about that a few times already here. I know that's been an audit finance push from Mr. Holland, Mr. Winslow to try to minimize those lease costs. This is a big part of that. That campus renovation project also uh, helps to advance that. Fire stations, a couple things going on here. We've got similar to what we talked about in libraries for Chester and Ettrick. You've got smaller, older stations that just aren't even able to really to uh, absorb the modern fire apparatus. So those are replacements uh, brought back at 15,000 square feet and then Clover Hill and Dutch Gap, smaller, a little bit older. It's an expansion and a renovation of, uh, of those. Again, sort of providing that parity across all of our facilities much closer to that 15,000 square foot standard. So our total on the county side, $165 million. We have allocated to the school division, as you see here, $375 million. Again, that's been an advantage of waiting, being a little bit patient on the referendum. We're able to accomplish more projects than what we uh, have been able to uh, imagine in the past. Their referendum is really shown here. On, this is a slide from their chart last night. The blue line represents what they are planning to do with the referendum. You see the two middle schools up front. Again, that was made possible by the VPSA. Um, bond that uh, this board helped support and it's paid for, again, by your SRP contribution that made that possible. Another uh, way this board has supported the school division. But the 375 is in the middle of that page there. Um, and we'll walk through them by level of school uh, here in one second. I think this is the way that we really care to discuss it by looking at through the stratus lens to see if these project selections make sense by looking at the uh, projection data. And we certainly appreciate uh, Logan, Ashby, and 
the rest of that team that, uh, that worked on this, but I think it really helps to bring it into focus. So let's start at the elementary level. Uh, the projects here are Grange Hall, 360 West, and AM Davis. AM Davis up front, you can see projected capacities by FY26 or by 2026 over here on the right-hand side. Clearly, AM Davis fits um, that mold from even a condition perspective, but certainly from a, a projected capacity. Um, you see the 360 West, that's a capacity um, place. And then Grange Hall, it's a 100-year-old facility that would uh, be re rebuilt as part of that. They have actually identified as well at Old 100 uh, Elementary School as kind of that next project and recognizing that, you know, based on development trends, you know, that's one that they have. Um, we go back over here. They've got that below the line. And I think that's a smart way to go about it. Um, so if conditions on the ground dictate, I think this board has with Mosley Elementary School, with the two middle schools, you know, when the need has arisen, we have found a way to work those into a plan. So they're just identifying kind of that next project. And uh, it's not highlighted here, but there's actually Bensley Elementary too. Um, that one is, a again, a little bit of an older facility, but it helps to provide capacity relief when you look at it. They're going to expand the footprint of that school. And so Hopkins Road Elementary, which is the next um, highest capacity elementary on this list, Mr. Allen, you see we'll get some significant relief from that Bensley project as well as some of those others in the area. You've got some potential to, to redistrict and move some of that around. So the Bensley um, topic does make sense from, uh, not again, not only a condition, age of building, but it really does provide some needed seats so you kind of get a, a two for one in terms of uh, that project. On the middle school piece, um, again, these projects are underway, but I think it really makes since when you look at this map, again, the darkest blue is where we have the most uh, capacity constraints. So Fallen Creek and Tomahawk, those are the projects. This board looked at this data back in late summer and said, go get it. And uh, so those are you know really underway. And then the Midlothian Middle Rebuild, kind of the companion project to Grange Hall, both of those facilities essentially 100 years old and also provide some capacity there at uh, Midlow Middle. And then when you really look at the rest of the lineup for, for middle schools, um, and I'm only showing the ones that are over 100%, you know, looking out to 26, it's in a more manageable state. And then lastly, we've got 360 West Area High School. You can see Cosby at 135%. Um, Meadowbrook shows up next at 118, but I think we've gotten some indications from the school division that, you know, that can be dealt with by some of the capacity and some of those surrounding areas. Midlothian's next on that list, but certainly the, the 360 West High School, but depending on where those lines are drawn, um, would, would absolutely pro potentially provide some relief. So all in all, if you look at all of these projects, as well as the Chester uh, Middle School campus with, with Thomas Dale, which is also one of the school initiatives, a smaller project, but again, helps to maximize some of those resources. When you hold the stratus lens over top of the CIP that we received from schools really this morning. I think it lines up, you know, very well. From a financial perspective, I think it uh, it certainly makes sense. Mr. As well. Harris, before you advance to the next slide, I think just between the, the, the colors you see in the spectrum of below 80 percent to the uh, over 100, 120 percent, mm -hmm. you know, and I think it may have been brought up in even a liaison committee meeting is that as we instill a capital infusion for new schools or, or larger schools, that when there's such a contrast between one district that might be below 80%, as you see on this particular screen, that may be adjoining something that's over 120%, as part of this exercise, you know, we have to trust and, and get to know a little bit better the redistricting challenges that the schools may have and face, and, and again, how they are strategic when we do create a, a new school, of how best to design that district so that it, it's actually forward thinking five, 10, 20 years so that we don't run into things that are a redistricting issue uh, as part of this exercise. Mr. Chair. Y yes, Mr. Helen. Th thank you for mentioning that, Dr. Casey, because I'm looking at this projected capacity at Cosby at 135%. Is that 135 I'm reading? Yes, sir. Numbers? I thought so. I'm not sure what the current capacity is, but I know in our comprehensive plan, 
we indicate that schools are required after we reach 110. So, yeah, so this is this is the 20, yeah, 2026. So you know that's okay. that's looking down the road. So they're that's they're right. not there yet. But I mean, I think what we want to do from a capital planning perspective is, you know, if we don't do anything else, kind of where are you know these capacities going to land? So that's what we're showing throughout the okay. course of the presentation. So I think this just you know, sort of reinforces the idea that the capacity needs, by and large, are in the West, and certainly Cosby's at the top of that list, but, you know, sure. Midlow is, is sort of catching up a little bit. Okay, thank you. It, and again, the only other comment I would add, too, is, again, from discussions, maybe liaison, maybe other types of meetings we've had with the schools is, especially for high schools, uh, the seats that are occupied every day in our trade and technical centers are not counted towards the capacity of our system. They all, each student has a home school, that, that at some point in time, they're not there the entire day at that home school. Uh, there's utilizations of, of uh, uh, virtual learning, especially for juniors and seniors, to the school's credit. They're looking and pursuing that as far as where a student may be uh, during the day that may be interning uh, with a business possibly. Uh, and then it's the Tyler Community College that, that again, with dual enrollments or their, their capacities during the day at least, uh, as more and more of their students may be night students, that there could be arrangements to address it. So the capital program before you, you, we've presented to you that the schools have presented as well is, is something we're comfortable with. But having said that, I think we need to draw the bigger circles around the whole exercise of where students sit during the day and how best can we manage a capital program going forward. Mr. Chair, and, and to add to that, there is significant conversation on school side about actually having opportunities for totally virtual learners. And how are those numbers gonna be counted? And how are we gonna factor those into Stratus also, Mr. Harrison? Mm -hmm. So I think those are really good conversations. I mean, I am, and continue to be very candid about the fact that I would rather my student at a high school level be in a high school with the capacity even in the 100 to 120 percent than in the below 80 just by nature of what happens with the availability of the dual enrollment programs the options the specialty classes all of those things that factor into that and so it's concerning to me as i watch what we would put up to be the current capacities at high schools and look forward to 2026 in four years to these capacities knowing that monacan right now is really low that james river is projected to be low that that I, you know, we, we've been pretty candid again, Mr. Engel and I on liaison about this need for them to look at this districting issue and take into consideration all of the issues that Dr. Casey has mentioned, as well as this aspect of what the virtual learner that never really, that might be assigned to a school for specific opportunities and inclusion, but never really occupies a seat during those hours. How we count that person, we take availability of the, um, honestly, the, the attributes of having state and federal dollars coming in that really don't require the overhead of a building. So those are some of the challenges I think that we're going to continue to put to our colleagues um, on the school board to address and um, and I think that, you know, Mr. Harris, you've probably heard us say some of this before, but I think that it's going to be a challenge, too, in our conversations across the aisle um, and helping them mold that, what those numbers look like and how that feeds into a stratus model that makes sense for us to make these decisions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I just want to uh, second those comments because it's, the virtual is so important. We have changed the way we educate. And as I said during our dinners, uh, maybe two, a couple of months ago with our uh, middle, uh, school uh, chief, we need to think about how we're doing education in the future differently uh, in terms of the, the last two years of high school and students being able to actualize community college, junior college, changing the structure of learning because it, it's the one area that doesn't change as rapidly is in education. We tend to be lagging the marketplace with regard to what we need to be doing for the future to change. And I think the, the economy has changed, the way we educate has changed significantly in terms of virtual, which I'm glad to hear. But also, uh, our students may not need to be in school for half a day and many, you know, only take one or two classes. We need to think about that from a cost perspective so as to not accentuate create additional huge capital costs uh, on the citizens in the county. So we need to th start, I think, thinking innovatively how things are done, how we can do be better. 
And we can be leaders in that market, I believe, in that area. But I think it requires thought, it requires uh, intention, and it requires us to get there hopefully before we see 120 to 30 percent capacity. Thank you. Good comments. And I would, I would just also mention that we've had interest and in, we've seen some movement uh, from uh, private schools uh, mm -hmm. coming to Chesterfield County. And we have to remember that every seat that a private school takes is taking probably one away either from another private school or from, or from the public school uh, sector. So it's just another variable that's in that mix. We are right now, it seems very attractive for, um, for the education, a private educational market, if you will. And Mr. Winslow, to your, to your point, I, I think there's a private school that's going to have 1,200 students opening up in central Chesterfield County. So how do we factor those into these models? How do we factor in the homeschool population that has become much more versed and supported in homeschooling, especially the, the K through 2 grades? And, and again, how do we factor that into our, into our modeling exercises? Mr. Yes, Mr. Carroll. Don't forget repurposing CTC Hall. That's right. That's right. It's going to also shift that capacity around as well. Absolutely. Well, so that's that's kind of the project lineup. But again, I think I think everything you've said is is correct and things that we're looking at. I think the good news here is, uh, you know, this plan can be you know justified by and large with data that's already on the ground. It's not really a speculative play. 2013 for schools was really about sort of the renovation. There was not a lot of seats in aggregate added to the system. I think this has a much better balance of adding seats where we know we already need them and dealing with some hundred you know, plus year old structures that need to be, uh, to be renovated. Whereas all the concepts you're talking about hopefully slow down the need maybe for that next referendum. And I think that's where they can be very, very useful. Now last topic in here again, we wanna you know, sort of look through stratas, but we also, first and foremost, we want to look through our debt policies and our affordability lens and make sure everything we're talking to you about can be afforded. This is just a snapshot of our key debt ratios. Only message here is as we look at it, not only for projected for uh, where we'll land for 22, but we look all the way out to the end of this referendum. We are in compliance with all of these. We start to get a little bit close on the payout ratio. Again, our goal is to have, if we didn't issue another bond in 10 years, we would have two thirds of all of our debt extinguished. Uh, so we really you know, maintain that and care for that. And we'll show that to you here in this next chart. If you look at that light bar sort of triangle, if you imagine that across the, uh, you know, the duration, this piece here, that's that, that's that policy in play. That's that 65% coming off the books. And that's what really allows us to be able to go out and pursue a referendum like we're talking about here within a general affordability model like I'm showing. So this is the county side. So this is modeled at five years at 165 million. The orange bar is really where your debt service budget is now. And you see it sands a couple of years there in 2028 where you have to maybe do even a one-time injection in your debt service budget. You really have balanced this pretty well from an affordability perspective. So to be able to do that in five years, largest referendum, that we've ever pursued, I think that's really testament to our uh, the way that we manage our debt. We also do debt management for, for the school division. You see here 375 is a big swing when you stack on, of course, those uh, two middle school projects and Mosley, which was kind of a tweener project as well. But the delta here is very even above that uh, dashed line. And what it's made capable by, again, is extinguishing that um, SRP debt, that one-time contribution, creates that $10 million a year. If you stack that on where they are right now, they, they do not have an affordability uh, concern as part of this. And they'll bump into some policy pieces. So it's, it's a balancing act between those two things. You got to be in compliance with both. But I think you really see graphically here the value and why uh, it was so important to pursue that SRP payment because it allows them not only to do the middle schools, but to, to feed in this $375 million referendum, and they're not seeing those shocks to their debt service budget on an annualized basis. Uh, Mr. Harris, before you leave that slide too, I think it's good to note to the board the conservative nature you and your, your department of budget has in, in debt service uh, rates. And, and again, we, it can only improve upon it with our triple, triple A and the one six one point seven percent we had gives us even additional capacity towards our policy. 
Right. And so, so when I sit at the end here and say, you know, something like the old 100 elementary school, which I know that's a topic they're having, like how can you feel like you can fit that in? Once I get two or three, four sales under our belt, we know what that rate environment actually is. It can produce some savings, not only from an affordability perspective, but from the policy framework. So that's why that's really important uh, to make sure that we you know, budget from a conservative perspective. Although I think each day it becomes less and less conservative unless they uh, can get a, a top on inflation. So um, that's, that's really the, uh, the financials behind it. Referendum time, I think this is really important. Again, this is the formal presentation of your referendum. We will uh, have lots and lots of community input on this. There is a, a CIP public hearing on the 23rd just to get you all to um, voting on the overall budget on the 6th of April. But that's really where a lot of the, you know, the major maintenance stuff, it starts, but the referendum, if approved, uh, really gets going after that time period. It's a summer exercise to petition the court to actually put the question, uh, joint question, county and schools on the ballot. And then our community engagement is, uh, you know, probably mid-summer all the way up until folks are voting in the fall. We would have all the dedicated websites and all of the infrastructure that Ms. Pollard has under her belt and works collectively or I had conversations with Dr. Tylus to, to make sure that we are selling this as an overall organization. But it will be a a summer of uh, going out and, and meeting with folks individually and uh, making, again, good access to social media and all the things we have that we didn't have in, uh, in 2013. With that, I'm happy to uh, take any questions you might have. Board members? I just want to make a comment. Um, and of course, it's good to have this information and know where we're headed. And when I'm, I'm sharing this also for my, our liaison committee as well, the one thing, because we're going through a challenging time with COVID after having experienced it for two years, I know learning has been a challenge because of virtual, but I think it's very important we keep our pulse on uh, the accountability of learning and make sure our students are actually uh, benefiting greatly from the increased expenditures. I don't know anyone who's more advocate or more uh, advantageous or who's more supportive of education and, and spending uh, relative to education. But one thing I think is very important too, as we talked about earlier, and that is accountability. Uh, you know, uh, how our students, how are our students doing? Are they in fact uh, continuing to improve? And I think that those measurements are so critical as we look at the spending levels, as we look at what, where we're going, is that, that we are actually really meeting the needs of the students who are in our school system. And, and what can we do differently and better? So I hope we'll have not only the spending, but also the accountability of what those dollars are providing us uh, down the road as we go forward this year. And certainly next year will be critically important as we emerge, uh, I sincerely hope, out of COVID. So I just want to make that comment about accountability and, and spending the buck the best way possible. Thank you for those comments, Mr. Holland. Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Harris. Appreciate that presentation. Thank you.